Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. We have another episode on quantum computing. I'm really excited. We have Dr. Alexei Marchenkov joining us. Thank you for coming on yeah, the show. Thanks for inviting me. Really um, appreciate it. And we have a lot to talk about. This is a very important field. Very grateful that we have you on the show. We had Will Zhang on the show a couple weeks back and we're just starting to scratch the surface on this really important topic. And actually, you were at Rigetti for two years prior to I now was, Bleximo. Yes. And <clears throat> so Bleximo is now two years for you founding this. Yeah, so almost. we incorporated in February 2017 yep. Yep. as a company. Approaching two years. And so you did a PhD in physics at Leiden University That's in right. the Netherlands. And then you, you were assistant professor at Georgia Institute of Technology. That's right. For nine years. That's a long time. Uh, yeah. So before that, I was actually a postdoc at UC Berkeley. And so that's how I, I yeah. came in uh, to US in 97. Berkeley was the first place I fell in love with that. Uh, of course, yeah. how you cannot. And yeah. I liked your origin of, <clears throat> of like interest or excitement in the universe because you said there's scales and you, you know, humans are in the middle and then there's the cosmos right, and, the, right. and the atoms and then you wanted to play and test and, and you, that's why you chose the small scale. That's right, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so you can, in physics, you can work with objects of any size and then uh, um, I really was fascinated by things very big or very small and when I actually just entered um, uh, I, I, I entered Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology and started studying physics, let's say, professionally. This is when things like scanning tunneling and atomic force microscopes were invented and it became clear that you can actually tinker with things like the individual atoms. And then uh, I realized uh, that I really like tinkering with things and things very big like galaxies and space uh, are very fascinating but you cannot make an experiment. You can not touch them. You can observe and record and make conclusions. And I love to just like hands-on stuff. So that, that, that determined my career of uh, working with uh, small things. And when things are small, atomic, they are quantum automatically. It's quantum mechanics. And that's uh, how you basically start learning quantum mechanics uh, with all its weirdness and tricks. And uh, yeah, so that's yeah. been uh, like this for, for the whole uh, life and career. And then what about your sort of uh, understanding of physics it got you into wanting to compute? What, yeah, where did that come from? Uh, it's, it's an applied field. And I've always loved uh, computation. So whenever, when you do physics, ultimately you make an experiment, but you have to back it up with uh, numerical modeling or of data, or you can run actually some kind of supercomputer simulation that would you then compare with your experiment. That's sort of, uh, you know, a justification that you need to do. And when I started, when I started uh, studying physics, computers were, there were no personal computers, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. So like Commodore's, Atari's, mm -hmm. game computers were, this is the level. So 2086 uh, Intel processor was, was, uh, was uh, rolled out when I was already like on the, f in the fourth year of college. And this is where I really started doing sort of computation and simulations along with uh, experiments. Right? And then you realize that computation problems can be very hard to do. It's, uh, even if you go from personal computers to supercomputers, there are just some problems that, uh, because systems that they try to describe have very uh, complex equations, they interact with each other, the amount of memory or processing power just blows up and you cannot yeah. simulate some systems, yes. right? And to me, then, after spending a few, many years in, in doing physics and doing quantum physics, uh, we lear I learned about Feynman's approach to quantum computing, uh, that you need to use quantum objects to simulate quantum objects. But it's really uh, only in like 2005, maybe, like around that time, it became clear that you can actually do this, right? So you can tame small quantum mechanical objects or actually 
make ones that behave like quantum mechanic uh, objects, but not small, right? So that you can use that. You can do computing with quantum objects. And that's, uh, that's, that's the path. And that's, yeah. that's, that's, I love the combination of the two. Yeah. What is the Feynman approach? So he has a very famous speech where he said we need, uh, it's, it's clear that uh, computers, classical computers cannot be used to simulate quantum, uh, quantum systems. We need uh, quantum systems to simulate quantum systems, right? And that's in, this, in essence what we're trying to do right now. Even the best, the biggest classical supercomputers can't simulate no. quantum. No, 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 no. So there are, People use uh, supercomputers for simulating quantum objects, but they take certain approximations, okay? Mm. Just to be able to uh, have enough memory and processing power to uh, describe in digital modeling a quantum object. So the amount of memory is gigantic. So if you take a molecule like aspirin, right? Oh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah there, we have actually sort of uh, a graphics. Uh, of that, so it, what, what gives people headaches, and uh, <laughs> so to speak, uh, in computation. And aspirin is, of course, a drug against headache. But aspirin is a, is, a, is a small molecule, and most drugs are small molecules, right? So it's a small molecule that interacts with a large molecule in your body, like a protein or something else. And uh, uh, can binds the very last slide. Yeah. yeah. The very last one. Yeah. Yeah, this one. Yeah. So that, that's, that's a molecule, it's pretty simple, but very effective, as we know. So it has only 21 atoms, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, very basic ones. And it has 94 electrons. So each atom has more than one electron, of course. So to do a true simulation of this kind of molecule using basic quantum mechanical equations, you need something like 10 to the 48 bits of memory. And just to give you the... Just to model one molecule? Just to model a small molecule like that. So taking into account motion of all electrons, how they interact with each other and all that. Whoa. This is the difficulty, right? So uh, electrons are charged particles. When one moves, others feel, but they're also moving. So Ooh, yeah. this feels that and the rest. So yeah. then, so it's, it's, it's sort of nonlinear interaction, as we call, yeah. that requires a gigantic amount of memory to describe that, Whoa. honestly. Yeah. Okay? Just give you uh, this number is about like 1% of the atoms that constitute Earth. So it's impossible to build such a computer, right? So like yeah. imagine 1% of Earth's atoms being a bit of memory yeah. to model that simple thing. We only need 162 bits, which is in, so Yes, yeah, so there is, uh, so. And this is just for uh, one right. molecule. Uh, That's what I can't. This is, this is, crazy. this is, yeah. So th this amount of, of memory can in principle be encoded by just about 160 quantum, quantum bits. So in, 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 in the case where those qubits all talk to each other, all can tangle with each other, right? And that's the power. That's the power of quantum computing because, again, I'm talking about like 1% of Earth atoms to be bits of memory, and 100 qubits is something that can be, in principle, if you use superconducting technology, and that's what we do, we can fit this number of qubits on this, on this, in, in, on this, on this, on this plate. So the way, this is a silicon wafer. This is something that uh, people use in semiconductor industry to make classical computers. This is a small one. Now what people at Intel worked uh, with 12-inch uh, wafers. This is a 4-inch or about 10 centimeters. So you can put 160 qubits on this, on this plate in principle, all right? And this is something that has a gigantic computational power when we learn how to tame it. Now, now what, 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 what on this wafer is you know, versus that, one versus one percent of all the atoms on Earth. You know, it's just this one little wafer. Right. You know how what yeah what is going on here that's enabling. Right. Yeah. So you have qubits or quantum bits, and these are, uh, in this case, they will be uh, superconducting qubits. So essentially, these are sort of microwave circuits, right? So and our superconducting qubits have small elements called joules and junctions, that are quantum mechanical objects in this sense, and they make those qubits to work, okay? So a, a quantum bit is uh, something that can take not only one or zero. Value it can be in the intermediate states, and when you entangle those qubits together, this is where the power of quantum gravitation comes mm -hmm. from. So they work all work coherently. They amplify each other, so to speak. 
So they probe all the possible solutions uh, of the problem. With classical computers, you essentially need to look at all the possible solutions one by one and then choose the one that's, that's optimal. So quantum chips, they look at all the possible solutions at once, once. and find the optimal one and give you the answer. And that's what makes them super powerful. Whoa. At, in theory. Yeah. <laughs> at least. Yeah. That, that, that in itself is such a, probably the most relatable explanation that I've heard of the difference between classical and quantum computing. So why, what is the architecture of, or what is the difference in, in bits versus quantum bits that enables it to see all of the options and then pick the one that's most optimal? Um, that's the entanglement phenomenon. Right. And so how do these 160 Q quantum bits, how do they entangle with each other? How do they know how to work together? Well, so we, uh, we use microwaves to run them. Okay, so we design a circuit where those qubits have a way of seeing each other through microwave lines. And then we use external microwave pulses to uh, run the qubits and run algorithms. So essentially, by sending the microwave pulse, and it's actually, it's about five to 10 gigahertz. That's typical frequency of what people use in, in, in cell phones, right? So you see that you send a pulse, a chirp, that's like is shaped in a certain way, and then you can basically put your qubit in the state that you desire, entangle several qubits, and run them. So quantum algorithms on superconducting circuits, essentially it is a bunch of uh, uh, you know, microwaves Pulses. sent in certain order you know, uh, that will run a certain algorithm, and then you'll have oh. the answer in the oh. end. The answer, by the way, in the end will be a bunch of zeros and ones, because when you measure a quantum object, right, so it will be either only zero and one. one. Yeah, only yeah, one. So, it will answer, be, so yeah. you cannot measure the intermediate state when yeah. they work. Yeah, yeah. So once you measure it, that's it. There is a yeah. bunch of bits. And then you have to interpret what you got at the end, like 160 zeros and ones, how it relates to the original problem that you posed. So, so, the f so the funding, and this is huge, congratulations, one and a half million dollars. Is this your seed round? It's a seed round, yeah. Yeah, and that was recently announced, what, a month ago, pretty much, last month. Uh, yeah, so we closed a bit earlier, yes, but the announcement was in mid-September. Mid-September, and so um, who were the, is it, who were the funders, can we talk? Okay. Yeah, so yeah, we can. Uh, so interestingly enough, uh, the, uh, um, the lead uh, investor uh, is a venture fund based in New York and San Francisco. It's called ENIAC. ENIAC, yeah. And ENIAC, of course, is also the name of the first practical <laughs> funny, yeah. classical yeah, computer. Yeah, so it yeah, was really... Yeah. <laughs> so when I pitched to them, I said, guys, I am building the ENIAC of quantum computers. And <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a very easy pitch after that. No, it was not. Of course, we went through all the details. But that's, that's, oh, that's, uh, that's is a fund that's specializes in digital and computing technologies, right? And then uh, the, uh, yeah, so we are happy to have them uh, as partners. That's a tremendous support that they give us uh, already. And uh, I wanna know about this, you know, this about this one year, let's say, of this next, these next steps for you, but I wanna also tie that into what we were just talking about. With the microwave pulse that comes are you learning how to design the microwave pulse? Are you learning how to design the wafer? Are you learning how to optimize the, all, of the, all, of that, all of those processes for specific applications? Like what's happening in that year okay. in related to all that? All right, so um, it's all of that yeah. and it's all okay. coupled, right? So the problem is that and it's, you can't in, in, truth, in truth that uh, it's designing those <coughs> multi-qubit processors is still more art than and, and, and science. So we understand single qubit technology, all right? So we understand how to make those superconducting quantum bits from, uh, from, from like microwave films, Josephson junctions and whatnot. So we understand how we uh, can control a single qubit, how we can measure its characteristics. So we can actually even design this qubit to certain parameters to some extent. Uh, fabrication lags a little bit behind, right? So we can design sort of dimensions mm -hmm. and, and other parameters, but when you start fabrication, it's, it's, some of those elements are very small. Uh, some quick, of the, quick question, yes. is there a reason why they're one centimeter apart from each other? Is uh, that so it's, it's a size. Beside, the, the qubit itself, sort of superconducting ones are not too small. So to get the, 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 all, the, all the junctions, some electrodes, and, and, and sort of 
uh, guides for the waves and some filters takes about a few square millimeters. Okay. Right? But this right. thing works as a quantum object. It's large, but because it's superconducting and use some quantum macroscopic, let's say, superconducting effects, it works as, a, as an artificial atom, so to speak. All right? And that's the beauty of superconducting technology, by the way, is that we can design characteristics of those atoms. We can tune. While there are approaches to quantum computing that utilize ions, vacancies, uh, some impurities, uh, magnetic impurities, and so on. This is where you are given certain objects, right? They are all identical. And then it, it works a little bit differently than what we do. We can here tune the circuit to our desires in terms of how qubits uh, themselves are, what's their characteristics, and how they interact with each other. So now chip design is, where do you rank that in terms of the importance of what you're doing and then just the importance of quantum computing success? Is chip design at the top? I think that's it. Yeah, yes. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So, well, there are two things. Let's, let's me put it this way. So there is the chip design, um, well, three. Mm -hmm. uh, chip design itself, right? Because you have to be really careful about how you design your qubits. If, uh, if the design is off or you don't take into account uh, like parasitic effects, the whole thing just is not going to work. Uh, manufacturing is the other thing. So uh, we are all- Do you make it yourself? Yes, yeah, so we make it ourselves. And what's the material that you use? In so uh, we are standard technology in this sense. So silicon wafers that you see here works only as a substrate because it's a super flat, super smooth surface, yeah, yeah. right? So it's, it's reliably, we, we super, super semiconductor industry did a lot of work to get us perfectly flat yeah. <laughs> surfaces to work with. Wow. And that's very important. Yeah. And then we deposit, uh, we, we do some lithography. We, it's, it's, a, it's a process of basically making masks through which we then deposit metals. Uh, then we make junctions. And then, yeah, so this is something that's still done in labs. So there are some initiatives of, uh, and some people uh, who are thinking about building foundries. That is, uh, at some point you can, um, you can uh, just uh, make a cheap design and you can order it somewhere else. So at this moment, this kind of service is not available yet, right? So, uh, so I get to have their own uh, fab. Um, in many clean rooms and uh, in, in top universities, you can you know run this this corresponding processes. But truth to be said is that the purity of material, how you prepare that, and that you using your process only your own stuff, no one else touches mm. those installations, yeah. is very critical for performance. So magnetic impurities, and that's something that's frequently people use doing yeah. like other objects. This is going to kill your chip performance. And does it, it has to be in a vacuum setting for there not to be any impurities while it's happening? Uh, when the process is going, but s s say, uh, so you, you, have, you have this metal deposition. That's, what, what you do is that you basically you know, boil metal <laughs> with an electronic beam or something else, and then it evaporates. And then you have your chip with a mask, and then it just catches some of that vapor. So assume that you, you have an impurity somewhere sitting around, someone else is left. It also will go to vapor and it will be deposited on your wafer somewhere else. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's, so that's, 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 yeah. Design, manufacturing, and the third is? Uh, right. But, 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 but. So design, manufacturing, and, and then actually how you shield them. Okay. The sh how you protect. Because, oh, shielding. Yeah, shielding. Because we deliver microwaves. Right, five gigahertz, but I said that- That's first powerful, five gigahertz is pretty powerful? It's, it's about the frequency. It's the power, frequency, yeah. power is actually very small. So we work with okay. individual microwave photons. The signal that is required to run each qubit is very small, right, as a single photon. And that's why wow, it's one sensitive. Yeah, it's sensitive. Runs the qubit. Yes. And it cascades the other ones to run. Uh, so, so to speak, yeah. So they, th th that's yeah. the level of the signal. Yeah. But of course, uh, in, in the surroundings, there is always like noise, electromagnetic noise. Oh, yeah. and, even, uh, and even sort of what's called black body radiation. So each object radiates yeah. Yeah. Uh, photons. Uh, and then depending on the temperature, right? So you get a peak of this radiation, the sort of frequency. 
And then, uh, so there are always photons radiated by the environment at the particular wow. frequency a qubit works. Yeah, yeah. So that's why actually we cool down to almost zero temperature. It's just to remove that thermal noise. Partly. Thermal noise. Thermal as well. noise on top of just after Interesting. the metal becomes superconducting. That's one use of low temperature, but okay, also cool. the reduction of noise. noise. Okay. And then you also have to shield that. You have to put different kind of screens because it's not only thermal noise, but you know, people talking on cell phones and a lot of noise comes from environments. So these things are very well, have to be Shielded. very well protected. The signal wow. slice have to be perfect. You need to do a lot of, you know, this error, error handling, error management because of that. So you need to be sure that the photons that reach your qubits, the microwave pulses are only the controlled one because anything else, any noise destroys the state of the qubit and then the whole calculation is destroyed. So if you have like 160 qubit, but one is, uh, you know, one makes an error, right? Yeah, so you're, you're done, your calculation is not good. Wow, 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 wow. Design, manufacturing, and shielding, what a package. And then that's not even talking about the quantum programming. That right, was, right. Yeah, so now, yes. yeah, what about, what about that? Well, because uh, we, we, this were, is, we were prior to show, we yeah. were talking about the, the, fun, the you, have to, right. you have to make this for specific application. Like we were talking about simulations right. for quantum chemistry for the drug uh, yeah. companies. So that's our approach. And this is where we are a little bit different from incumbents and what Google and IBM are doing. So they are producing, uh, so they're basically uh, making sort of certain uh, qubit arrangements on their wafers and the count is five, 19, uh, now, uh, it's about 50, that's the next of IBM's. So Google promises 72, Rigetti now has 19, I believe. But those qubits are um, manufactured on the wafer in, the, in, 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 certain, in certain arrangement, right? So it's, we call it universal processes because ultimately sort of uh, what these companies say is that here is a quantum processor, this is how the qubits connected. Now you guys need to figure out how to use this architecture for the particular problem you are solving. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So what we're trying doing is a bit different. We're wow. saying, guys, here is the, tell us what the problem is, and we will make a chip that will solve that particular problem or a class of problems yeah. like quantum chemistry more efficiently. So we will arrange qubits in a way that it will run that particular calculation much more efficient than the universal architecture. At least this is this is we this is how few model systems we're thinking about. And this is, some, this is the next step for the company's demonstration of, of this concept, right? So it's, it's going to use qubits in a much more efficient way. So when you have, it's, it's an equivalent of ASICs, application specific integrated circuits. And, yeah. in, 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 uh, it's now in everyday life because your iPhone and, uh, you know, uh, contains mostly application specific circuits, mm -hmm. even your graphics card <coughs> on your computer, you know, is an application specific circuit. Why? It works with a particular type of data, particular process much faster. So that's, to yeah. us, yeah. is the best way to achieve and demonstrate the usefulness of Absolutely. quantum computation for real problems. Yeah, okay. Because we already have it in our phones and our computers in terms of the application specific integrated circuit. Yeah, ASIC. so, yeah. And so it only makes sense to do the same thing for uh, all the different quantum computing problems and uh, the simulations right. that we want right. to run. Yeah. It doesn't even seem like it makes sense. Why would, why? So Google and IBM are, maybe they're trying to take a, they're, they're trying to take a one size fits all versus a, uh, 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 make it for the specific case. Um, I wouldn't speak for them, but I think that uh, um, a lot of approaches we are now at the stage of development of the field where, uh, quantum computing field, where really a lot of approaches needs to be tried. So we yeah. have evidence, yeah. uh, theoretical and some experimental, that our approach can give advantage. Whether the market will be such that ASICs will win or like more universal computer will ultimately be the winner. Uh, Time will show. The wow. universal computers, though, everyone mm. acknowledges that to build them takes something like about 10 years plus. And to us, uh, costs are overwhelming. So yeah. just to give you a number, to run a one single qubit, superconducting qubit, okay, 
uh, you need the fridge, refrigerator, you need electronics, and even if you just calculate time and materials, it can be anything between twenty and forty thousand dollars per single qubit. Wow! It gives you like the cost of, of of a machine. It's not much less if you use some other technology, right? Yeah. So tens of millions of dollars for hundred qubit. Yeah. Uh, machine. Yeah. Okay. You want somehow it to work, and to us, optimization of the processor because the rest, the fridge, the rest, it doesn't matter. It's the same cost. Ninety-five yeah. percent is there. So the process architecture and how it utilizes the qubit count is the key thing to like a demonstration. That, that's our take. So that's how we will approach. In a way, this is how first computers were built. Any act to which we refer yeah. to already was exactly hardwired to do certain problems, right? Yeah, and yeah. then blocks were assembled together to reprogram that to do another problem. In a way, I think we need, as a quantum computing industry, to just go through the same path. Interestingly enough, the, the, these are, even though these are application specific, they also give just enough openness to, for you to run all of these different applications. Right. So that's yeah. also so, as I can see here is that something runs, something runs your uh, display, something runs something else, right? But they work together, so they work like as logical modules that perform yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of functions. But when you program those things, of course, uh, at the, at the, at the, at the level of programming at some point the fact that it's an application specific architecture or chip it's taken into account but programmers of apps do not see that anymore yeah, because yes. this is the, the, this has been developed already into the environment like high level language where you don't need to think about that so yeah. we still need to think about that we still need to think about how to run qubits at an elementary level so it used to be called assembly language you know you really need to understand you know how pulse propagates down to the chip how it's runs on the chip what it does etc cetera, etc cetera. As an industry, we will grow at some point to when we will have probably some universal design tools and software yeah. for quantum chips. But at the moment, we really are just you know arranging it by hand, seeing you know how it works, whether it's coherent, whether it will give us answer, it will stay you know coherent, and then if you move something, the rest kind of follows, and that's that's why it's still an art. You know. I really, I really enjoyed how your, you know, your hypothesis about the future is that we still don't know what is going to win a universal one or application specific one, but I'm, I'm liking how you're describing that application specific one, and I, and I like this example. I think um, explaining this example a little bit more would be um, really helpful. That the, it's, it's really expensive to understand uh, quantum chemistry, and so pharmaceutical companies are constantly um, trying to understand how chemicals react uh, and run right. simulations for that. So. In this case, you can um, do things like better understand personalized medicine and just save billions of dollars in these. So why don't you explain this to us a bit? Yes, yeah, so, um, yeah, so when, when, when you talk about uh, a drug at the elementary level, so what happens is there's a small molecule, aspirin or other molecules, they have about the same size, it's like tens of atoms. So ultimately they need to interact with something in your body that causes the disease. Frequently it's a protein, you know. And then uh, they need to chemically bind to each other, right? So, uh, and this is a quantum mechanical reaction. So binding is a quantum mechanical, so when molecule, small one, binds to the large one, a quantum mechanical process happens, okay? And that's where we can do the simulation. Uh, so why is that? Uh, first of all, just the numbers. So uh, pharmaceutical industry is $75 billion a year on R&D, on research and development, on drug development only. So typically to get one FDA approved drug, so you require 10,000 of those candidate molecules and about 10 years of time out of which sort of first like two or three are spent on pre-selecting these molecules before they go to preclinical and clinical trials, okay? So 10,000 becomes one FDA approved drug. So it's typically about, again, 10 years and about, depends how you calculate, but like people say it's about $2.5 billion. Some, 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 some drugs can be like cheaper, some can be super expensive, yeah. but that's the average industry number. Jeez. If you could just cut, you know, uh, out of those 10,000 molecules, reduce at least through simulations, some number of molecules that are likely to fail during these expensive trials, yes. you're saving billions of dollars That's on that. Works. Yeah, yeah. Okay? So ultimately, why people don't do this? Well, people do, they try. But to simulate that 
interaction is difficult on classical computers as we discussed. Yes. You know, so 21 atoms, and that, that's it. That's what you can get. So the precision is not there. It's very expensive. It's very costly. So this is where like quantum computing can be super helpful in the industry like that. But of course there are other industries like petrol, energy, where uh, similar like chemical reactions or molecular interactions take place. And then uh, this approach in principle is the same as for drug design or for uh, many other industrial uses. And then it's quantum chemistry to speak like. Yes. You know, what other terms. applications are you uh, going to be uh, taking on clients to, to do work for? Uh, the quantum chemistry is, the, is something that's the easiest thing to do. And the reason is this. So as, as I mentioned, you have a quantum mechanical reaction on one side, right? So these are your molecules. And you have a quantum mechanical processor on the other side, right? So you need somehow to simulate like Feynman's original idea, simulate one quantum system with, you, with the help of the other one. So we, we call it mapping, right? So this, this kind of problem is quantum on one side and the easiest to map. Yeah. On, on, like to make the algorithm that will simulate this behavior with this chip. Okay, so that's 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 how you start. But ultimately, this kind of you you can you can you can work with classical problems as well. So you need to learn how to take a classical problem, and typically a lot of the problems are optimization problems, right? So they involve some cost functions, so-called cost functions that you need to minimize to get an answer. Right, so it, it's important to understand how to map those classical problems yeah. onto uh, quantum chips, right? And whether this quantum mechanical system really simulates well the behavior of your classical. Problem. In a way though, in drug design or uh, other instances, that's what we do, but our cost function is energy because ultimately chemical binding is finding the minimal of the energy when those molecules basically bind together and that will be the configuration. So the approach is going to work, mm -hmm. the way we approach the problem is going to work uh, for optimizing classical uh, cost functions. It's just that it's the easiest way to do for us now, quantum to quantum, and then people, but people start thinking about already a lot of practical problems in optimization, machine learning, AI that can utilize quantum algorithms. So you, do you write the quantum algorithms yourself then? N no. So this is where uh, theorists and very smart people are required to do that. So we uh, collaborate with uh, theoretical groups that develop quantum algorithms that we can you know, then run on our processors. So we are focused Whoa. on hardware development and particularly, particularly on chip development. There is a lot uh, still to do, and this is the key. If you don't have a chip, you don't have a computer, right? So that's, that's, that's what we focus on as a company and collaborate with uh, scientists, other groups, and other startups to build uh, full uh, stack machines and actually, you know, algorithmic side, yeah, as well. So then their quantum algorithms will enable you to run it on your chip, which can then make the simulations happen of the quantum chemistry and yeah, stuff so, like that. Yeah, so the simulation problem is posed, then they write sort of it in the quantum mechanical language. Yeah, yeah, okay. Some, some calculations are done how to solve that what quantum mechanical one problems on the chip. How do write that in quantum mechanical language? Oh, well, so it's, so, some problems are easier to write. I mean, uh, quantum mechanics in a way is, is a beautifully simple theory because equations are so, <laughs> so simple. Right, it's just few few terms, and that's it. It's very difficult to solve. So, once you you can formulate a quantum mechanical problem in a very inefficient way, and then but you can also work theoretically so that it, it's kind of becomes simpler to solve. And this is at that point where we can fit it to. So we need some work, some optimization, some simplification of of a very generically set quantum mechanical problems to still run it on quantum chips. So that's the work that people who are theoretical physicists do, right? So the, the, these are the specialists. I'm an experimentalist. I tinker with things. Mm -hmm. I understand, try to understand what these smart people really do. But yeah, I'm focused on, you know, building the thing, building things. Well, 
Okay, what does it look like once Bleximo gets rolling? What does it look like for, which it, actually you taught me the name is what in Latin? It's, it's no, it's Greek. It's, it's Greek. Entanglement. It Just means in, entanglement in Greek. In Greek. Yeah. Bleximo. That's so cool. And then, okay, so what happens once Bleximo gets some more momentum, like with, with uh, designing, manufacturing chips, uh, running simulations, once you get momentum, does the chip get sold to the Pfizer? Do you design chips specifically for Pfizer? Does Pfizer send you simulations and you have an army of chips that you've designed for them? Um, so, at this moment, so th there is, the vision is as, as, as follows. So, industries and companies that can afford quantum computing right now um, to be exclusive for them, let me put it this way, so are big corporations, okay? So, um, our approach is that we first talk to uh, clients in those corporations and see the particular pain points when they utilize high performance computing, some numerical methods, and see whether they, we can help by building an accelerator, because again, this computer, our chip will not replace a supercomputer. It will work in conjunction with them, but, but it can really solve some things cheaper, faster, more precise, like the energy of interaction that no classical computer can solve. Yeah. Okay? So we will work with particular clients first. And then the hope is that, and again, this, this comes from some experience. Uh, basically, I, I've, I've done some research back at Georgia Tech where, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, we did experiment and then we had a supercomputer simulation that, that kind of run, so simulated the behavior of that system. So the, the hope is that the chips that we build will be universal enough. They will be still application specific, meaning this is a quantum uh, chemistry or drug design chip. But it should not be thought as this chip uh, is in, uh, like is to build for this molecule, and we need for the, for the other molecule we need to build another chip. It's yeah. not like that, yes, right? Yes. So we will provide a platform where we can basically build an accelerator for a class of problem, a particular class of problems for a particular industry yes, that yes. will then utilize that. And then you, that builds a library that you can yeah. Use so a logical that. course, if you will. Logical so the course. architecture, how you yeah. build. Say for the, uh, you can think about company like Synopsys, right? That's, that's yeah. a typical company that provides solutions like in terms of logical cores and, and, and how to build systems on chips application specific processors for different industries. So we believe that uh, quantum computing industry will develop like that. Uh, we are in the early stages of where we're still kind of trying to tame the, this power Right, but we can start building practical systems even with the current level of technology. That's who, how big is the company? How many people are you hiring now? Uh, we're hiring, so we have six people right now, so we'll hope to grow to 10 people by the end of this year. And are but these PhDs in physics mostly? Um, actually engineering primarily. So we are, we are like uh, affiliates Electrical, mechanical. mechanical, yeah, so in computer yeah. science. Cool. So we were lucky to get into uh, an accelerator called uh, Cyclotron Road. This is, yeah. Uh, yeah. this is an accelerator based at the Lawrence Berkeley lab. And uh, there are a lot of people there who are physicists and engineers who are interested in working on those problems as well, and they collaborate with us. And that's a, that's a good part of being there. So yeah. you can really uh, sort of leverage the expertise that the Department of Energy built in those labs and facilities and uh, the mechanical shop is, uh, there is no any other in the world I think that, 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 that can maybe compare it to what uh, they have up there. The clean rooms has already been built. There are some processes that have already been set up that are suitable for us to utilize in building quantum chips. So overall that gave us a tremendous boost in terms of like company development. So. We don't need to build many things from, uh, from the ground, so we just yeah. can leverage whatever is out there. Yeah. Okay, and now, what 
do you think is the most interesting part of what is going on in the quantum computing explosion that we're experiencing? Um, I think that's um, that the realization that applications are nearer than people thought even a few months ago yeah. is something that settles in many people's mind and people start looking at quantum computing as something that they need to start using and thinking about as something that's near term. There is even a term now called NISC, noisy intermediate state quantum processor that, that describes the level of the of development of quantum technology. And this term uh, is now on everyone's mind. And people understand that we can now build integrated circuits. We can build circuits with tens and uh, hundreds of qubits in the nearest future. Let's take a look at how we can utilize that power at the current level to do practical problems. And this is what a lot of conferences now are being uh, arranged around. So there was one in Canada two weeks ago. The one big one down here in Palo Alto in December, European and worldwide. So that's that's I think the very exciting, uh, very exciting era we are now in this in this, in this particular field. And what's the acronym again? NISC. NISC. N Noisy intermediate scale quantum. Noisy. Intermediate scale refers to tens and hundreds of qubits because universal ones will require like hundreds and thousands of, or millions of qubits. Oh wow. So NISC is something, again, that's something that will yeah. be on, the, on the, in a single refrigerator, yes. on a single wafer like wafer, that, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. and take it about the size of this room or a bit less, maybe. You know. So that's, that's the area we're in, and that's what a lot of people start working on and realizing that that's, that's, it's very close. And did you just say that even a 100 qubit wafer has to be in a fridge space as big as this room? Uh, yeah, well, the fridge is the same for one qubit or 100. Or 100 right? qubit, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you, you require a little bit of mechanical equipment to run it. Uh, then you require like control electronics. But let's also not forget that for, wow. so for accelerators like we built or any computer, you still need like a lot of uh, servers, like classical servers to run. You need to control your machines, you need to control your microwave electronics, you need to interpret data yes, yes, yes. and do that. So that's why I'm saying computer equipment racks plus wow. fridges, but gotcha. it's, uh, the feeling is that it's there. So it's, it's very exciting to, uh, to be, to live in this time. So this is something you can already like vision, like an envision that's something that's within the reach. So they were very excited at Blacksmo to be, you know, able to work on that. So most of us for the whole life, you know, dreamt about something like that. And it's a difficult yeah, problem, yeah, but yeah. you know, we feel that only difficult problems are worth so, working on. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Do you, is there something else, I want to ask you a couple questions that we typically ask on the show. Is there something else related to Bleximo, related to the near-term quantum computing that we definitely need to mention before? Um, about the company itself? Or even about near-term um, quantum computing in general, yeah, what you're doing in the space. Is there something else that you think is really pressing that we should speak on? Some things are secret, of course. <laughs> this <Yeah>. is our <laughs> so, um, um, again, I think that um, um, the quantum computing is becoming an industry. So uh, there are companies that now uh, work on different pieces that are useful for quantum computing, like refrigerators or special electronics or special methods to work with errors in, in, in software format, special amplifiers. So it's really becoming a, a, an industry, right? People start thinking about that, and that's what, uh, what makes me think that we are accelerating as the industry, and applications will be here, and practical computers will be here much earlier than uh, most people kind of project. You sometimes can hear five, 10 years plus, never. Uh, I think we were more optimistic about that, yeah. So that's, that's, that's I think that's, that's that's my impression. About I like your breakdown that there are so many individual components to the quantum computing explosion industry that's going on. So people can focus on just the fridges, right, just right. the chip design, right. etc. Yeah, I, I think yeah. again, the core is the chip. So yeah, the core is the chip. Right. Yeah, we, yeah. We're still totally. we're still struggling totally. with. Uh, 
I'm still uh, struggling coherence. trying to understand the microwave pulse and how that ent- helps entangle and how the. I don't even. I, I still don't. How 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 the information goes. The information is in the microwave pulse, and then it cascades into the. Information is in in qubits in this intermediate states. Microwave pulses control them, control control the algorithm, the flow of the calculation, right? But the power is quantum mechanics. The, and how does the, the, the fact how that does the question come in into the? This this is this is this is, this is that's it, right? The so you pre- comes in. yeah. So it's it's the question comes as you prepare first those qubits in in certain states. This is how you start the calculation. But the input comes in via. Pulses, yeah, via it's all microwave, microwave pulse. pulses. Yeah. So the input comes in via microwave pulse, then the qubits entangle, entangle or, yeah. and, and, and then you still control them with microwave pulses you still to do the calculation. Yes, yeah, so you send out the pulses. You get, when you measure, you get one output. You, you, when you measure, that's yeah. a measure, measurement process, yes, you, we call it collapse. Collapse, yeah. yeah so yeah. it collapses from this from uh, from all state of the possibility. Yeah, into zero or one. So yeah. that's, that, yeah. and that's, that's the power. And the difficulty, we cannot correct errors in oh a way because gosh. once we measure, that's it. That's so, so you measure, you collapse your calculation. I want to run a simulation the size of Earth, and I just want to, just because I, I want to see what happens when we evolve, when humans evolve with different variables. Like what would have happened if we were closer or farther from the star, or the planet was bigger or smaller, or evolution, maybe the asteroid didn't hit and hit the, the dinosaurs. How much longer would have they been here? I love questions like this. And so I like to, I want to run those simulations. I think that's, again, so what you are talking about are problems that are very demanding in terms of the yes. scale of the calculation. Yes, it is. That's why we need this right. at one yeah. million so qubits. S- something yeah. like that. But look, I mean, it's all important. Uh, it's, it's important to understand how you pose the question and uh, this algorithm thing, right? So in digital computers, you know, if you pose the question not the right way, you will get an answer. But is this answer worth it? Yeah, yeah. You get a bunch of numbers. You need to interpret them, right? So. Uh, but so, but problems like that that require large scale calculations, like, like lots of data to be processed, or the model is so complex that your memory requirement explodes when you do the calculation, is something that this this quantum machines can handle as no other digital platform can. Yes. yes. Right. So we'll need to just pose the pride, the question, the right an algorithm in the right way, and then this calculation will definitely be uh, possible. Yeah, that's great that you care about how the question is proposed because that's what yeah, that's what we do so much on the show is we figure out how to propose the question and then hear how the guest answers it. The industry's exploding. I want to ask you a couple questions on the way out that we ask our guests. Alexi, what do you think about this? Do you think we are alone in the cosmos? I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. Um, um, I subscribe to theories that sort of um, tell that intelligence is possible elsewhere. The question is whether it's the same as ours. And to me, and this is, I love, uh, I love uh, Stanislav Lem. I, I, I know if you uh, know this, this, this uh, sci-fi writer. He was a physicist by education. The question is that uh, even though we are not alone, whether we're capable of communicating with each other. We cannot communicate between like two people. Like the relationship between two humans is a difficult part. We look at the same thing, but I doubt that we see the same thing. Totally. Like, yeah. By the way, you yeah. and I have a very different perception totally. of that object. Totally. So to me, it's, it's really the question is whether we'll be able to communicate. And this is very fascinating. I've been always fascinated by that, uh, seeing if there is any, any other civilizations, whether we send like satellites or send, send like microwave pulses to space, but maybe they're thinking in a different, like in neutrinos, as some propose, or something like wow, that. Wow, yeah. You know, so that, that, that's something that st- still fascinates me, uh, sort of on a level that's not like building practical things. And yeah. this is still my connection to the big <laughs> cosmos size yeah. things. Yeah, I keep following what's going on in astronomy and cosmology. Yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's very fascinating. Which, I think we're not alone though. Yeah. Would uh, telepathy be the best form of communication? I, well, uh, I think that uh, we need to know how other, 
other aliens, whatever we call brains work, or whatever they have for brains. To me, this will be a method, but something like more elementary needs to be you know, established first. But ultimately, telepathy is tuning your brain completely in sync with something else. As I said, let's try to, like two humans, <laughs> to do that between ourselves, then, 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 then think about that. As a man that runs so many simulations on behalf of other people, do you think that this is a simulation? Uh, like us? Yes. Some days feel like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be on, sometimes like, um, look, uh, what, what, uh, you know, so uh, in a way, in a way, so I, I prepare a quantum chip, I send their pulses, this thing evolves. I subscribe to the theory that Big Bang started everything, and then it evolves. It's in, in a way, it's a simulation. Yeah. Whether it's a single one ever, yeah, or yeah. there are like billions of parallel universes where, you know, we started at the same point and they evolve in, <laughs> in a different way. Yeah. So I, I would say yes. Uh, so uh, ultimately, you know, we are, I, I'm a physicist. I, I do believe in laws of physics, right? So we may not understand some, but definitely the evolution of like the universe as a whole is run by physical law. So in a way, it's a simulation. I just hope that, you know, we can change things a little bit. Uh, but whether it's a part of simulation or <laughs> we, there is a free will, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I subscribe to the theory, at least I hope that we have free will and we have a way of changing things, so, yeah. yeah. And then last question is, what do you believe is the most beautiful thing in the world? <laughs> you know, honestly, uh, and this is, a little, this is a little bit in sync with what I just said, I think that self-awareness is something that is a gift. It's a curse sometimes, but it's a gift, right? Because intelligence exists in different forms. There are very primitive like organisms that you can say are intelligent. But the fact that we're self-aware and then control, you know, this, this is something that uh, I think is the most beautiful in, 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 in uh, this is what, what, what makes me believe that we can do things and just not flow with some, 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 something, right? So that, that's that we can drive, we can make uh, conscious decisions, we can reflect back, you know, and if some decisions are wrong, we can correct them. Uh, but that's to me, I guess, is a very is a very beautiful thing. Blessed that we were given consciousness by evolution, and here we are today. And and if we can reflect better and move forward more effectively as a civilization, then I think we can make it longer than we ever thought before. I, I think so. I think communication is a big is a, a very big thing. Yeah. Just on on a human level, uh, even so, I was always. Um, fascinated by social sciences as well and yeah, actually one definitely. of the things that I was kind of playing with a little bit before f switching full-time to quantum computing is actually whether you can do simulations of social uh, processes and thought processes. I think so, I think that'd be fascinating. And there, yeah. uh, there, there are books written about that and there are, there are models but this don't is again. You, don't you run those all the time when you walk down the street? You choose to smile, you choose to frown. There's a simulation. Oh, you, you know, see how the other person reacts. You hold the door open, you choose to right. walk. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But globally, the system is so complex, and whether we can sort of improve something. I mean, it's yeah. the, the point of simulation is not sometimes understand, but to me, it's improve, right? Yeah, we're working on this because this is a quality different level of how we can do things in so many domains that we cannot even predict in where. So social to me will be very important as well. So just how to run like society, run in a way that understand why, why there is hunger where everything says that we have abundance of resources. Yeah, yeah. It's something maybe very small thing which we're missing because the system is so complex. Maybe these things will happen that. Yeah, yeah. So this is a very complex, highly interacting system. Maybe we can do some social modeling. modeling in quantum systems that can solve not only practical problems like drug, but like 
problems on a, on a, on a larger scale. Agreed, yes. I'm so excited for the near-term quantum computing future. Thank you so much. All right, thanks for inviting, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on and for building this future. We desperately need you and other people to pool resources and get involved in this. We know that you know, China took on their $10 billion quantum computing initiative and um, the US government needs to get behind this. Entrepreneurs, private entities uh, need to get behind this, more funding behind it. This is fascinating stuff, the, the chip design and manufacturing and, and actually understanding how qubits work and what that means for computing. It's, we're, I, I know nothing about it, I'm just scratching the surface and I hope as civilization we can, uh, we can really dig deep and figure it out. It's up to you guys as well, it's up to all of you. Definitely get involved in the space. If you, find, if you find it interesting, give us a comment below. Let us know what your thoughts were on the episode. We'd love to hear from you. Also, um, do check out uh, bleximo.com. The link's in the bio. Go check them out. Um, Ron, thank you for producing and directing. Much love to you. Uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Also, remember that we need your help with, with prospering here at Simulation, so do join us. Uh, we have our Patreon as well in the bottom. Support us, help us grow. Much love everyone, peace.